faith? What does it signify you know, to us? And the first thing I want to share with you, the ascension signifies the glorification of Yeshua. It indicates this great glorification of the Lord. In John chapter 17, verse 5, and this is the prayer that Jesus prayed at the Last Supper. It was his final prayer at the Last Supper. And he said this, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So he is praying now he is to go back to that place of glorification that he once had uh, with the Father. Now what does glorification, what does the glorification of Jesus look like? And I'm going to share something with you. It's interesting. In Matthew chapter 16, 28, Jesus is talking to the apostles. And um, he says this, Truly I tell you, some of you are standing here, you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now he's talking, he's talking to the twelve, and I've had people come to me and point this passage out to me and say, was Jesus mistaken? Because we know that he didn't return while the apostles were still alive. Right? He hasn't come back yet. So when they look at this, they're thinking the rapture, they're thinking the second coming of the Lord. Now I want to I show you something. This is Matthew 16, 28. It's the last verse in chapter 16 of Matthew. And I think most of you realize that the verses in chapter numbering were not added. Okay, until, well, it was a man named Robert Stephanos who added the chapters and the actual numbering of the verses of the New Testament in 1551 and of the Jewish Bible, the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, in 1571. So I, I just want to, again, remind you of this as students of the Bible. Context, context, context. If you pull Scripture out of the context, you pop this verse out of its context, and it almost seems, right, that Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. And that's, again, what the, the people who attack, the skeptics who attack Scripture, use this passage for that. Now, if you go to chapter 17, this is what Jesus is talking about. So it says, and six days, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and and John, the brother of James. Now, remember he said some of you are standing here. Some of you, here's the some of you. Peter, John, and, and James. And he led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured, metamorphous. That's the word there in the Greek. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And what you have here, this is a appetizer of the glorification. It's a foretaste of, of, of the glorification. Jesus here is transfigured before them. He's glorified before them. They're standing with him, and he's looking right in his earthly form, and suddenly, before their eyes, it's like, bang! He's glorified. Now, the Apostle John the Apostle John is the one who says in his gospel seven times, I am the one who Jesus loved. He really makes that distinction. And John is the one who puts his head upon the very chest of Jesus. He puts his head, I mean, he hears the heartbeat of God at the Last Supper. Yes, he does. And he must have been, he must have been, you know, maybe the youngest of the disciples, but he had this special heart for Jesus. And he puts his head right on his heart. John goes old. And he's exiled. And he's for his face to the island of Patmos, this island out in the Aegean Sea of the Mediterranean. And he's now old, and it's the Lord's Day, and it says he's in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and the Lord appears to him. And in Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to read this to you, verse 12 to 17, I'm going to show you a little clip from the movie The Apocalypse of what John actually experiences and what he sees. He experiences the glorified Lord. So it says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were white like wool, and white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, and as a refined in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth... 
when a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, remember, he's the one who put his head upon his bosom, the one that repeated over and over again, I am the one that Jesus loved. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. When he saw Jesus in his glorified state, he just, he, he just wiped out. Now watch this, watch this scene from the movie. This again is the movie The Apocalypse with Richard Harrison. Let me get this back here. You turn up the sound, please. soldier or fisherman, you were on your feet all the time. Even the priests in the temple, they never sat. So when, when you're looking and you're studying the, the tabernacle in Exodus chapter, uh, you know, chapter 25 to 40, and then you go to the book of Leviticus, you see the Levitical priests in the outer court, they're continuously offering up sacrifices, they're continuously ministering in the outer court. And then when you see the priests in the inner court, they're continuously, right, they're at the table of showbread, they're altar of incense. They're at the seven, uh, the seven candlestick, uh, candelabra. They're constantly ministering there. So when a person sits, what does that tell you? What are they doing? They're resting. They're resting. You know, they're, 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 their, work, their work has been done. And the picture of Jesus ascending into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father, His redemptive work here on earth is finished. So it tells us in John 17, 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. By the way, again, that's the Last Supper. He's now going to leave there, go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to pray three times, not my will, but yours be done, as the cup, that cup of the sins of the world and all of the, the penalty that comes with it is being placed upon him. And now determined, he goes to the cross to die. He hangs on the cross those six hours that Friday. What does he say at the end? Right? To Palestine. It is finished. It's done. He pays the price in full. 
He was raised on the third day. He appears a number of times over the course of 40 days. And then he ascends into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. What is it? The battle is over. The price has been paid. It is finished. I want to show you something really unique that the Lord revealed to me a number of years ago. When Stephen, well, Stephen in Acts chapter 7, the deacon, he preaches this incredible message before the religious leaders of Israel. And he infuriates them. He infuriates. Sometimes when you preach the gospel, you infuriate people. And as he's preaching, he infuriates these people, and he gets stoned. As Saul of Tarsus stands there, right, supervising as they lay their garments down at his feet. In verse 54... When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus. Notice this. What is he doing? He's standing. Standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man. Again, whenever you see the Bible repeat something, you need to really pay attention. You pay attention to everything all the time. Standing at the right hand of God. He's seated at the right hand of God, but when one of his servants is being persecuted, he stands at the right hand of God. I just want you to think of this. What would you have done in that situation? You've got got a bunch of angry religious leaders who are now going to stone you for your faith in Jesus Christ. Honestly, what would you do? And I want you to, to see this because I believe that Jesus, when He stands for us, there is a supernatural empowerment that flows from Him that came upon Stephen. So in verse 59 and 60, while they were stoning Him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then He fell on His knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep and Saul approved of their killing him. I believe this again is a picture of the Lord standing and empowering his son Stephen with this supernatural power, this miraculous power. Now you understand this, when when you you have miracles, you have signs, and you have wonders. And as I said, I believe they're all one. They're just different, different words that represent different aspects of it. The miracle here is this supernatural power that the Lord has given to Stephen. The sign. Signs always point to things. What is it pointing at? It's pointing at Yeshua. Right? Because Stephen is saying what Yeshua said on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, don't hold this sin against them. And the wonder... The wonder is, I believe, the effect that this had on the people who were doing this. Especially one whose name was Saul of Tarsus. Because I I believe that this is the beginning of Saul's conversion. That God did something to Saul. And Saul was was very, very well versed in the law. He was very well versed as a Pharisee. But he was also well versed in understanding what Jesus did and what Jesus said. So he knew that Jesus, when he was on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And now he sees this man while being stoned. And of course, again, when a person was stoned, when people were crucified, they would be cursing and spitting and mocking their their persecutors. And here Stephen, he says, Lord, you're going to hold this sin against them. I'll tell you my my belief about, about... Saul, who becomes Paul and becomes the greatest, the greatest Christian of the world. Saul was in Rome, and I believe Saul was beheaded. He was a Roman citizen, so he wasn't crucified. I believe Peter was crucified. Saul was, well, Paul was, was beheaded for his faith. If you're a Roman citizen, a citizen, you had the privilege of capital punishment of being beheaded instead of crucified. A lot easier, a lot less painful. And I believe when, when, when Paul was, was beheaded, he put his head down upon that block down, and that axe came down, and in an instant, Paul was with his Lord, grabbed onto his Lord, and he said, wait, Lord, 
I need to go and talk with Stephen. I need to have a conversation with him. I need to thank him. I believe the Lord gave Stephen this, this incredible supernatural power. And I believe this. I believe this about, you see, Christians would have been martyred. And there have been millions and millions of them through the ages. And the numbers number over 100 million. But I believe that God gave them a special supernatural empowerment when they were dying for the faith. Just like he did Stephen. And that is again Jesus standing and imparting his power upon Stephen, who was stoned, and imparting his power, his supernatural power upon us. And again, that is a picture of what the ascension gives to us. It signifies, right, his glorification, but it also signifies that he's at the right hand of the Father, giving us and empowering us to be the people that he's called us to be and do the things he's called us to do. The third, the ascension signifies Yeshua preparing a place for us. So it tells us in chapter 14 of John, verses 1 through 4, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Go, I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, he's been up there for 2,000 years preparing a place for us. Could you imagine how wonderful that's going to be? I was sitting outside this morning, and I'm reading Psalm 66, and it just talks about the creation of God, and the creation of God reveals the very supernatural power, the, the, the incredible omnipotence of God, and the omniscience of God, His wisdom as well. And I'm looking at it, and I'm praising Him, and I'm praising Him. Have you ever noticed the trees? They praise God. They lift up their arms to God. And the birds were singing songs to the Lord, and the rabbits were dancing around here and praising the Lord. And, and I'm in the back, and I'm praising God. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm just thinking about, hey, Lord, how great in this world your beauty is. And it's been marred. Right? It's been marred by, by, by humans and by our pollution and, and all kinds of But this, this world, how beautiful it is. And again, it's, it's a fallen world. Could you imagine how incredible that place that he's preparing us is going to be? How, how incredible it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's going to be for us. So, I believe he's going to prepare a place for us. I believe what the scriptures teach us that our works here as believers are going to actually have an effect that we're going to take with us in the next life. So just understand this. The scriptures teach us, right, we're not saved by works, but we're saved for works. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. Now again, we're not saved by works. All the works that you'll ever do are never going to get you into heaven. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection. But now, if you've been saved, He has given you His Spirit, and He has given you work to do. And the work that you're doing now as a believer, and Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, 19, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust do, uh, doth corrupt. Lay up yourself treasures where they won't rot. They won't rust. They're going to have an, an eternal uh, you know, nature about them that will live on forever and ever. So those of you, I'll just say, those of you who served here this week with Vacation Bible School, you've got a rewards coming to you for that. Right. And the people in the nursery, and the people in the Sunday school room, and the people in the sound room, and the people who are over at the Good Shepherd, and you know, people who are doing all the ministry that goes out of this place, well, that there are rewards that you're going to receive uh, in the next life. So let me tell you this story. There's a woman. She's a Christian, a believer. She was saved by the grace of God. And she dies and she goes to heaven and she gets to the pearly gates and Peter meets her there and the gate opens and she's ushered in to glory. And if you look really carefully here, see that? There she is. There she is walking with Peter right there. Can you see that? You can just kind of barely see her walking on the streets of gold. Right? There's the river of life. There's the streets of gold. There's the trees, the trees of life. And 
So she's walking along, and then she says, Peter, where's my mansion? So there, she's walking along, and she's looking, and you know, right, right here, she sees, she sees a mansion here. And she, Is that my mansion? He says, no, no, that's Abraham's mansion. And then she looks at the mansion. She says, "Is that my mansion? No, that's Ruth's mansion. Is is that my mansion? No, 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 that's that's Paul the Apostle's mansion. Is is is, is that my mansion? She says, no, that's Mary, the mother of the humanity of Jesus. That's that's her mansion. Is that my mansion? No, that's Timothy's mansion. Is, is that my mansion? No, that's Silas's mansion. So she walks all the way down the road, and they come to the end of the road. <laughs> He says, there it is. She goes, why? And Peter looks at her and says, that's all we can do with what you sent us. There wasn't a lot of laughter with that just now. Think about it. You're giving, you're serving, you're loving. All those things that you do, that, that essentially you do out of a pure heart and with the right motives. Look, look at what, what it tells us in 1 Corinthians 3.13. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work for what sort it is. I want you just to stop and think, you think of this. Everything you've done in this life that will burn up with fire, it's not coming with you. But everything you do that will not be burned up by fire, you're taking with you. It's building materials for the Lord in heaven. Again, we're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. Nobody, nobody can save themselves. But the works we do, we're going to carry with us into the next life. And the things we do, and I'll just, I'll just stress this, the things we do out of a pure heart, the things we do with pure motives. You ever do things with impure motives? Yeah. I have. I have. Right here in this church, I, I've done things out of a compulsion of duty. I've done things not wanting to do them. I, I, I've done things because I was concerned about what other people were thinking about me. I can't say I do that anymore at this time. But, but I've, done, I've done things with the wrong motives. I don't think they're going with me. I don't think they're going to be there with me. It, it's the things that we have done out of just a pure heart for the love of God, the glory of God, and the love of others. Those are the things we take with us. So it's not only what we do, it's what we do with a pure heart. So the ascension again signifies He's there preparing a place for us, but we are partnering with Him. So the works that He's doing there, the, there's going to be some incredible stuff up there for us. And what we're doing here on earth at this time we have is going to contribute to what we're going to be experiencing in the next life. All right, number four. The ascension signifies Yeshua as our high priest. So in Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now I want you to see the word sympathize. He is our, our great high priest, Jesus the Son of God. The word sympathy, it actually, today, it's, you know, sympathy is... You feel bad for somebody, but you don't do anything for them. You know, you watch the kids that are hungry, and you watch the kids that are starving in Africa, or the kids starving in Latin America. You watch it and say, isn't that so terrible? But you don't get off the rear end and do anything. That, that's really, you know, that, that's some, the, this word here, sympathy, if you really get into it, what it's saying here, if we had to put a modern word on this, it's more like empathy. Yes. The Indians say that a person with empathy is a person who has walked in the other person's moccasins. Yep. And that's what Jesus has done. Jesus has walked in our moccasins. Jesus has said, He knows what it is to be human. He knows what it is to feel pain. He knows what it is to feel lonely. He knows what it is to feel grief. He knows what it is to feel betrayed. He knows what it is to feel deserted. He knows what it is to feel tired. He knows what it is to feel weak. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be thirsty. He knows what it is to bleed. 
And he knows what it is to die. And he knows the effect that sin has upon us. For he had no sin, but he became sin. He took our sins upon himself on the cross, and he experienced the horrible, devastating effects that sin produces in our lives. Right. So he knows our every weakness. And when we go to him in our pain, when we go to him in our loneliness, when we go to him in our weakness, he's not surprised. He knows what it is. So he's, he's an empathetic high priest. In verse 25 of Hebrews 7, it says, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to him through God, to come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I want you to see this picture. The concept he's making intercession for us, and I'm going to use a I'm going to use a human picture that's been used for 2,000 years to, to help you to understand this. The scripture teaches us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. If you look at this picture, that, that angel on, on the left is, is Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren. Brethren, notice he has his little notepad there. And he's writing down, he's writing down all of our sins. The picture is Satan is the accusing, he's the accusing attorney. He's the prosecuting attorney. And he, he comes before the Lord and he says, he says, Frank has broken your law. Frank has coveted. Frank put the New York Yankees before you this week. He didn't have you first. Frank isn't loving you with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind. In fact, it's probably not even half of what he's capable of. And he's certainly not loving his neighbor as himself. Frank is guilty. And Jesus is our defense attorney who stands there and says to the Father, that Frank is forgiven. Frank has been justified. Frank has been covered with my blood. He is the high priest who is himself not only the priest but the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world once and for all. And he covers us with his blood. So when the Father looks at me, thank goodness he doesn't see my sins because I would have no hope. No hope. I'm totally unworthy. There's nothing, there's nothing in me that would ever make me worthy of heaven. God is a consuming fire. I just want you to say that it's not that, that God is a consuming fire because he doesn't love us or like us. God is just a consuming fire. He is perfectly holy and there's no sin in God at all. And he will not tolerate sin in his presence. I want you to see, have you ever been in front of a big bonfire? And we used to go up to Camp the Conic, man. We used to make, we, we used to say, you can make a little fire, have, have a little fire, campfire. And all of us pyromaniacs, we would go and we would like 12 feet of wood that we would light on fire. I mean, we'd light up the, light up the whole sky that, you know, with that. It was an incredible experience. You, you, you get close to that thing, though, you're going to get fried. I mean, I think you, you're way 20 feet, that heat is so intense. When you get near that, you're burned. Well, God is a consuming fire. I try to approach God in my sinfulness, I'm done. But when I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb, I've got a fire suit on that protects me. And he is the high priest who has offered up his own blood for our sins and he makes intercession for us. So the accusations don't stick. Number five. The ascension signifies Yeshua as the reigning king. So in Ephesians chapter 1, 22-23, and it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. So here's a picture. He reigns over his church, our king, the king of kings. He reigns over our lives, but he reigns in a very unique way. So you look, you look at kings through the ages, tyrants through the ages, they, rear through, uh, they, they, they reign through power, they reign through force, they reign through fear. But he reigns over our lives through love and grace and mercy. He reigns over our lives as the sacrificial soup, uh, substitute for, for our sins. He reigns by love. And we surrender to him not out of force. The surrender flows from a heart that is overflowing with love. 
I was going to share something with you. I'm going to share, I shared with you a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday night a dream that I had many years ago that was very powerful and God calling me to minister. And I do believe God speaks to us through dreams and visions. A lot of our dreams have nothing to do with God, just the craziness of our brain trying to sort out stuff. But I believe when you, you wake up from a dream that you've had and God says to you, hey, I want you to remember this and I want you to write it down, it's usually something that is revealing to you. And this is a, actually, a, I'll say this, it wasn't so much a dream when I was sleeping. I was on an airplane and I had this vision. I've had this vision a number of times. That I am there watching Jesus walking down the Via Della Rosa, which I've walked a number of times in Israel. But I'm watching Jesus walking down the Via Della Rosa. And he's carrying the cross. And I know he's carrying my cross. I know he, he's, he's now bearing my sins. And I'm, I'm looking at him, and I just continuously say, no. No. I'm like screaming out, no. I go, no. And, and I follow him to go with him, and I watch him nailed to the cross, and I watch them lift him up on the cross. And I'm, I'm there at the foot of the cross looking up at him. And I'm still saying no. And then I, I fall down on my face. And suddenly, I sense his presence there, and he's there in front of me, and he lifts me up, and I'm weeping. And he takes me into his arms, and he comforts me. My surrender to him is, is not because of fear. My surrender to him is not because I'm afraid of going to hell. My, my surrender to him is not because I'm worried that he's going to withhold blessings from me. No, my surrender to him is out of his love for me. That's right. We sing here, King of my life, right? Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Just think about that. Because that's where I've experienced a love like unlike anything that I have ever experienced in this life. That He, the creator of the universe, who sustains all things, would come to this earth and die for me, one like me. And I forget that sometimes. I'm not proud of that. I forget it sometimes. It's, Lord, take me back there again. Let me go to get something with you. Let me walk along the Via Dolorosa with you. Let me watch you nail to that cross. Let me let you let me see you hanging there on six hours that Friday. Let me see you dying for me. Let me see you dying for me. The ascension, the ascension is him in his reigning power over a people over a people of 2,000 years who surrender to him and submit to him because of their love for him. Right. You won't find anybody like that. Anybody in religion or philosophy. Anywhere. You won't find nobody. A lot of religious leaders that people follow, they follow to get. There's a lot of people who follow for all sorts of other reasons, sometimes out of fear, but not out of, out of this unique a surrender of love. Last thing here. The ascension signifies that Yeshua will come in a like manner. So in Acts chapter verse uh, 9 through 11 in chapter 1, again, this is another account of the ascension. It says, Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The same way he went up, he's coming back. So it is a promise. The ascension gives us a promise. Yes, he, he's got to He will come back. And I believe what that's talking about is talking about what we believe is the rapture, which I believe can be happening very soon. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18, 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, and here's the key thing, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words that there is going to be an entire generation of people at some point in history who are going to be taken out of this world and will meet the Lord in the air. And that is called the rapture. Amen. Amen. The great rapismos. He will come and he will take us up. So in the ascension, yes, there's, there, there's the ascending, but that he will descend and meet us in the clouds to take us with him. So here's our, here's our, our final application here. And I'm going to just share with you for a moment here from John 16, verses 5 through 7. So at the last supper, Jesus says this, But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Lord, don't leave us. Imagine you know, you're there with Jesus and you've been walking with him for three and a half years and you've watched him do the miracles and you've heard his teaching and you've experienced his unconditional love and he's saying, now, now I have to leave you, Lord. Don't, don't, don't leave us. And he says in verse 7, nevertheless, I will tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. And so he says, it's better that I go than I stay. That I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper the Holy Spirit will not come to you but if I depart I will send him to you the powerful our helper our comforter and the spirit of the Lord the spirit of Yeshua who's just like Yeshua better that I go because now you see I won't just be around you now I will be in you now I can clothe you last few weeks with power from on high. And I will always be with you. So the ascension, and here, here's, our, here's our wrap up with this. The ascension promises us that I will be with you when you walk along the sandy beaches of life and when you walk along the rocky beaches of life. I will be with you in life's dilemmas. When you don't know what's up and what's down, when there's confusion, when there's chaos, I will be with you to impart my divine wisdom and truth to you. And I will be with you in your weakness, in your times of brokenness, in your times of weariness, when the world exhausts you and snatches your strength from you. I will be with you. And I will be with you in your loneliness. When you may have been deserted by everyone in your life, I will still be there. And I will be with you to guide you and to lead you by those still waters and those green pastures. And I will be with you to carry you when you're too weak to carry yourself. And I will be with you in your smallness when you feel insignificant. When you feel like your life just doesn't count, I will be with you. And I will be with you when you're in over your head. And you'll see my hand reaching out to you to pull you out of the waters of this world. And I will be with you when the enemy comes and accuses you of all kinds of things. I will be with you interceding for you. And I will be with you when you're persecuted. And I will be standing there empowering you with power when the attack has come. And I will be with you when you wait patiently for my coming and for my glorious appearing. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's the Lord you could have in your life. It's life ain't easy. This life is tough. I deal with people going through tough times every day. Some people are beaten up. Some people feel like they'd like to quit. But you can have him. You can have him in your heart. 
You can have his power upon you. He's promised you that. And he's up there looking down upon you and he's put his spirit inside of you. And you can have that if you open your heart to him. So I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads with me. I'll just say this to you. If you've never invited Jesus into your heart, you have that opportunity right now. He's passing through your life. Open your heart and say to Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and save me. If you have questions, you can come up, you can talk to me after service. You're welcome to talk to Pastor Sam, he'll be up here. We're going to share the Lord's Supper now. I'm going to invite those who are serving. Please make your way up. Prepare your heart to receive the Lord's Supper. Renew yourself in His death and His resurrection. I'll ask you all just to keep your heads down as servants take of the cup.